Hello, in this lecture we're going to work some smaller test type problems that could fit into a multiple choice format. So we have a company purchased merchandise from a supplier on credit terms to, I mean, 110N slash 30 for 11,300. So what's that mean? 1% discount if paid within 10 days, otherwise it's due within 30 days. So three days later, the company returned 1,200 of the merchandise. When recording the uh, return transaction, the company would do what? Now, oftentimes, it's it's good for us to think about what the first transaction is and then think about the returns. The company purchased merchandise. If we purchase merchandise on account, we would say that we are going to debit the inventory. Merchandise inventory would go up as an asset of 11.3. And we would say we didn't credit cash. Cash isn't going down. AP is going to go down. I'm just going to abbreviate that. I'm going to represent my credits with a negative. There's the debit. There's the credit. There's the journal entry. If you want to indent that, we can go to the home tab, alignment and indent so there's the journal entry now if we returned it then of course we have the reverse of this meaning the inventory that we just put on the books is now going away and it's an asset with a debit balance so we're going to make it go down by doing the opposite thing to it we're going to credit inventory for the amount we returned of 2100 and then we are going to debit something and if we had paid cash for it you would think we'd get cash back but we didn't pay cash yet we are reducing the payable. So we have a payable of 11,000. We're going to debit it, reducing the payable. We no longer owe the payable at this time. Next one says company had revenues of 2049, 2049 million, operating income of 993 million, and average assets of 1,303 million. The return on assets is what? So of course, to, to calculate this, we have a, a ratio, the return on assets that we need to calculate. And how are we going to calculate the return on assets? It's going to be the operating income over the average assets, total assets, let's just say assets. So that's basically what we need to do then. And I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll merge these and I'll center that and uh, underline it. So that's what we need. Those are the numbers we're going to need. And then, of course, if we plug the numbers into that formula, we have the 990 million of operating income so i'm going to say this is going to be 993 alt enter over the average assets and they gave us the average which is 1303 and we could just divide that out now i just want to point out that the average asset if you look at financial statements you're not really going to have an average asset on there you're not going to find average assets anywhere what the average means is basically we're trying to find what the assets were at basically kind of any point in time throughout that period, meaning the, and we can try to get the average by taking the beginning uh, asset amount divided and plus the ending average asset amount divided by two. That's basically the, the average. Where are you going to get the beginning number? It's the ending of the last financial statement last year. So if they didn't give us the average asset, it's the ending balance of the prior year, which is the beginning balance of this year plus the ending balance of this year, which is, of course, the amount on the balance sheet, divided by 2. So if we divide this out, we get 993 divided by 1303, and that gives us 1. But if we go to the home tab, numbers, and we add some decimals, it's uh, 0.7621. And, of course, if we make it a percent, move the decimal over, 62. If we add decimals again, 62%, 62, I mean, <laughs> 76.21%. Next one says, company sold inventory to a customer on credit for $4,000, terms 2, 10, and 30, meaning 2% if you give us the money within 10 days, otherwise it's due in 30 days, and the cost of the inventory was 3100 when recording the sales transaction in the sales journal, what's going to be the sales transaction. All right, so what we're going to have here is the sale. And generally, I would break this out into thinking about it as if you're selling something without inventory, like a service, and then think about the inventory. So two separate journal entries, although it happens at the same point in time. So if we did that, if we think about the sales half of it, I would think it's cash affected. We know we didn't get cash. We sold it on these credit terms. Therefore, what we got is an IOU accounts receivable. I'm just going to abbreviate accounts receivable, 4000 And what's the credit related to accounts receivable? Well, if it's a service company, if we didn't have any inventory, it would be income, revenue. In the case of, of this, it's that revenue account's called usually sales. Sales is the revenue or income account. We can indent that, home, alignment, indent. 
Now, sometimes people have problems with that because they don't feel like uh, they earn the revenue as they do feel oftentimes when we do a service company. We, of course, record revenue when we earned it, when we did work. But the idea of us giving the inventory away, that's when we earned it. That's when we earned the revenue. Now let's think about the inventory half of it as if it's another journal entry, even though it happens at the same point in time. The inventory is going down. Inventory is an asset. So it's going to go down with a credit of 3100 because assets have debit balances. And we got to do the opposite to it to make it go down. And then we're going to debit something. And that debit will then be the expense of cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold. So what's the net effect of this journal entry then? It would be credits going up, income minus expenses. Uh, 900 would be the, the net income effect of this. And I do want to point out that oftentimes people will report this. If we went by the strict rule of debits go on top and credits go on the bottom, and we recognize the fact that this is one journal entry, notice it could be written something like this. The two credits going on the bottom and it all being one transaction at one point in time. Again, in my opinion, if you want to see something and it helps you to see it better, then you're better off writing it in the way that it helps you to see it better rather than following the convention of having the debits on top and the credits on the bottom. Uh, it's best to have a better audit trail than to follow, you know, arbitrary rule like that. So many books are now doing this, setting it up this way rather than this way, but you might see it this way. Also note that we could record this in terms of journals, so specific journals that we would put this into. This is usually done if we were recording things by hand, where we could put the items into a journal and then transpose all those into the uh, general ledger at one point in time. Now, I would still put the journal entry out before thinking about the journal that it would go into. And the journal that we would talk about would be the sales journal, which would, they gave us here, the type of journal that it would go into. Uh, it, it's the sales journal because we're affecting sales, but it's almost more appropriate to think about it to, of, as the sales and accounts receivable journal, because uh, if, if we made a sale for cash, it would not go in the sales journal. So just be careful that, of course, we're going to put it into the sales journal, and then you can just kind of read off what the debits and credits uh, will be when when you look at the types of journals it'll tell you well the sales journal is going to going to debit account receivable and credit sales and it's going to debit cost goods sold and credit inventory and if you just do the journal entry you'll be able to figure that out the tricky part about journals is to know the fact that a sales journal means sale on account does not mean sale for cash next one says company sold inventory to a retailer for 1460 receiving cash on the time of sale the cost of inventory was 970 when recording the collection from customers in its cash receipts journal, company would do what? So again, we're kind of thinking, we're thinking about this in terms of a journal, the types of journal, which we would put together if we're basically using uh, a system that is by hand, like in certain journals that we report and then put those into the general ledger at the end. I would still think about the journal entry to do these, of course. And so a company uh, sold inventory, if we sold inventory, what would happen is cash affected in this case it is cash is going up we got cash we did not sell it on account the relevant point here is that note we're not talking about and they actually gave it to us we're not talking about uh the sales journal in this case even though we made a sale we because it's not sales on account so keep that in mind anytime cash is affected it's going to go into some kind of cash journal even if it was a cash related to a sale at the same point in time so we got the journal entry would be uh, 1460 and the credit would be remember I would think about it as if we don't have any inventory first as if it was a service company it would be to revenue or income or in this case sales the revenue type account I'm going to indent that home tab alignment indent and then record the half related to the inventory and so the inventory would go down inventory is a debit it's going to go down with a credit they gave us the inventory amount being this 970 we're going to debit something for 970 as well. I'm going to indent this home tab alignment indent and the debit will go to cost of goods sold. So there's the transaction. So when you think about the cash journal, it'll, you'll have to list these out when we record this in the, in the journal. So if it's a receipts journal, obviously cash is going to go up and then the other accounts that will be affected, sales is going to be credited. We've got cost of goods sold, debit and uh, inventory credit. So when we list it out in the journal, we'll have to rec record that in some way in the, the cash receipts journal format.
Next one says that a company purchased merchandise from supplier on credit terms 110 N34 16006 when recording the purchase transaction in the purchases journal, the company would enter what? So again, we're talking about the journals and they gave us the journal that we're going to use. So if we purchase something, remember the purchase journal doesn't mean purchase for cash because that would go in the cash journal. It means purchase something on account, meaning purchasing it on credit, meaning purchase it with accounts payable. So I would once again think about the journal entry related to this and that'll tell you what accounts will be debited and credited in the purchase journal. And therefore, so if we purchased something, we purchased inventory, merchandise inventory. Inventory is an asset. It's going to go up with a debit, 16600 We're going to credit something. That credit will be what? Not cash. We didn't pay cash. We bought it on terms 110 and 30. 1% discount if we pay within 10 days. And then otherwise, we have to pay within 30 days. And therefore, it's going to go into accounts payable or liability. Liabilities have credit balances. We're going to increase the credit balance with another credit. So I'm going to go to the Home tab, Alignment, Indent that. So the purchase journal, this will basically be the line item on the purchase journal. The purchase journal will say that uh, what we can put one entry, which will say debit, inventory, and credits, uh, accounts payable, because that's typically the transaction that's always going to go in the purchase journal. Next one says company sold inventory to a customer on credit for 2,900 terms, 3, 10, and 30. 3% discount if they pay within 10 days, otherwise it's due within 30 days. And the cost of the inventory was 2,000. When recording the collection from customers made within the discount period in its cash receipt journal, company would enter what? So again, we're talking about the journals. They gave us the journal that, that will be affected because we're talking about the receipt of the cash, the second transaction, not the sales, but the receipt. And we got it within the time period. And of course, cash is affected. Therefore, we're going to put it in the cash journal. What are the accounts that are going to be debited and credited? Well, let's think about the journal entries. So the company uh, sold inventory to the customers. There, therefore, what's the journal entry there? We're going to, I'm going to think about this in two different journal entries. We're going to have the sales price, which is going to be uh, not cash received, but AR is what we got, 2900. They owe us that money. We're recording that before the discount because we're assuming they're going to pay us after 10 days. That's our normal assumption. And then the credit is going to be to sales, revenue, income. It's going to be sales if we sell stuff generally. So we're going to sell that. Then we're going to think about the inventory half of it. The inventory half of it is that inventory is an asset. We've sold some of it. Therefore, it's going down for 2000 And we're going to credit inventory because it's a debit balance. And the opposite would make it go down. And then we're going to debit something. That debit's going to be the cost of goods sold. So there's our transaction. Now, they, they paid us, but they paid us within the discount period. So there are a couple different ways we can figure that out. We know that cash is affected. We can say, all right, well, cash, we know we got cash. But we didn't get what we expected to get, uh, being the 2009, because they paid within the discount period. A couple ways we can calculate how much cash we got. We could say, all right, well, the, they owed us. The sale amount was 2009, but then we gave them a discount percent, and that discount percent was 3% or 0.03. So I'm going to go ahead and go home tab and uh, increase the decimals numbers, increase 0.03 or percent, three percent. And if I'm going to go ahead and underline that, if I multiply that out, we give them a discount of 2009. So this times three percent, 87. We could see if there's any decimals, home tab, decimal, are there any decimals there? No, it's an even number, so we can keep it there. All right, and that's the discount then that we're going to give them. So how much cash did we get after the discount? Well, it would be the 29 minus the 87. Uh, another handy way to calculate the same cash amount here would be to just say, okay, well, the sales amount is 29. If we gave them a 3% discount, then if I make this a percentage of the sale, and I say this equals 100% minus the 3%, we got 97%. All right, it doesn't work that way. So I'm going to put this back over here. We could do it this way. This equals 100 minus 0.03, 3%. And then if I go over here home, home and I put the decimals, that's 97 percent wise, 97 percent. It's handy to think about it that way. If you go into a store and you're saying, what's the sales? What am I going to pay after the after the discount, after the sales price, uh, the sales amount? Well, uh, if there's a three percent discount, you're going to pay the 100 percent minus three percent, 
and then just say, okay, it's the sales price times 97%, that's how much we're going to pay. So the actual cash paid that we're going to get in this case is going to be that 2813, uh, and then we're going to credit the AR, the amount that is owed. The And note we cannot credit it for the 2813, uh, two, even though that's what we got. We got to credit it for the full amount, 29, because that's what we're actually going to get. And we should probably actually put this down one. But then we're going to have the difference being the discount. So then we have the discount. And that, of course, is going to be this number minus this number because we need another debit here. Uh, so that's going to be the sum of these. And we probably should call that sales discount. So negative sum of these. That's the sales discount, or we can calculate it to be equal to the sales price, once again, times 0.03, and then check that the debits 29 equal the credits 29, and then, of course, to be proper, we should have the two debits on top. So, in any case, when we, when we list out the accounts that will be debit and credit, we got the cash will be debit in the cash receipts journal, and so we're sales discount in some way, and then accounts receivable will have to be credited in that journal.